Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to continue talking about viruses uh, and more about why they do what they do. Um, and so for the schedule today, you're going to see that uh, we're going to cover viruses and their function and how they live, even though I shouldn't call it a life cycle because they're not alive. Remember that. But uh, And then afterwards, your only assignment for this lesson is going to be to check out a game put together by the CDC that looks at outbreaks. Um, and then a reminder for number three, if you haven't done it, you have until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. to complete the Unit 6 test, which is a multiple choice Google form. Uh, you only get one shot, so make sure you have enough time when you're doing it um, that you'll have enough time to complete it, because once you start it, you have to finish it. Um, and again, get that done by Sunday evening. All right, but for today, uh, let's jump into more about viruses. So hopefully you got a chance to look at the uh, coronavirus video to learn more about like why it's causing such problems, specifically like respiratory problems um, in hospitals and why we need these ventilators. Um, and hopefully you got a chance to look at those projections and those models. It'll be interesting to follow them over the next few weeks because those are constantly changing. So I encourage you to look at that data like day to day or week to week. So anyway, um, gosh, viruses. Okay, so last time I believe we made it to about here. We talked about viruses being um, infectious, that they have multiple parts, um, sort of a protein body, and inside there is the genetic information which is either DNA or RNA. But, um, you know, just a little bit more detail, like why do they have these structures? Well, they need DNA or RNA to copy themselves. That'll be clear later. Uh, the protein is more for protection because believe it or not, your cells are trying to kill the virus as it invades. And so that's kind of almost like armor. Um, they usually behave as a, like a parasite um, pathogen, and so they, they have a host. We are the host. They have to infect a host to copy themselves. Um, and kind of reasons why they're not alive is they, they don't really have their own metabolism. They don't create wastes. They don't reproduce without help from other cells. Um, and they can't do any of this stuff on their own, so that's kind of why we consider them to be not living. Um, but you might be thinking, okay, well, are all my cells at risk? What what can a virus attack and and what it can? What can it not? Um, viruses always attack a specific host cell. Um, and so they're definitely geared towards specific cells and specific organisms. Like the coronavirus going around right now started, uh, they think it, uh, might have started in a pangolin, which sort of looks like a, an armadillo. Um, but somehow, you know, basically a pangolin got the flu and then, you know, we got the flu and it, it, it's called a zoonotic virus. It's very complicated, but basically uh, the virus evolves to be able to infect either the animal or a human. And once that happens, then it can just infect humans. Um, but to take another example, rabies, um, rabies can affect infect humans, but it is only specific to brain or nervous cells. So it's not just like your gut cells or your skin cells. Um, and this is all because viruses have specific pieces and so do our cells. And those pieces have to match like a key in a lock. And we've kind of talked about this concept a little bit before, but on the right, you see a virus linking up with a cell and it has to have sort of the right key to fit the right lock, but we'll, we'll zone in on that later. Um, so, just one that I mentioned last time, the T4 bacteriophage, that only infects bacteria. And it has just the right parts to do that. Um, and so, you know, this concept is very specific to the type of virus and the type of cell that it's infecting. And this is a throwback to when we talk about cells with surface markers or receptors. The surface marker on a virus has to match the receptor site on the cell. And it's like you know, shapes fitting in, into another shape. So like a circle has to fit a circular or a 
pointed end has to fit a pointed receptor. Um, the, the part on the virus is called an antigen. It kind of generates antibodies and antibody response in your body, which we'll talk about much later, but the antigen is on the virus. Okay, so antigens are surface markers on viruses. Um, they can be spiky, they can be round, so to speak. They can be uh, all manner of geometric shapes. Um, but, you know, they have to be the right one to get into the cell. So what, what are the differences between these viruses and cells? Well, um, viruses can have DNA or RNA. Cells usually have DNA and RNA at some point. Viruses have a sort of outer shell called a capsid protein, whereas cells maybe have like a cell membrane or a cell wall if you're a plant cell. Uh, viruses don't have organelles. Cells do. Viruses don't have any cytoplasm. Cells have that jelly-like fluid cytoplasm inside them. Okay, so there's some major differences. Um, and that's kind of summarized in a chart here if you want to look back at it in the notes. I did post all of these notes and the notes for like the next month or whatever on uh, Canvas. You don't have to look at them, but they're there if you want to, to go over any of these specific slides. They're all in there. Okay. Just see the Unit 7 module. That's where all this stuff's going to be. Or, yeah, Unit 7. Anyway, um, so can we answer this question, are they alive? Well, let's look at multiple pieces of evidence here. Um, are they, do they have cells? No. And so that's the major reason why we don't consider them a living organism. Can they grow or develop? You might say no. I don't know. Development and reproduction, that gets a little iffy because they can sort of copy themselves. But you can still stick with no. Do they eat? No. Do they use nutrients? No. Do they respond to a stimulus? No. Like even when your cell tries to kill them, they don't really do anything to avoid that. Um, other than, you know, evolving slightly if your cells select and kill the easiest ones to kill and then the ones that are hard to kill are the only ones left over. So on a, on a big scale, evolution still happens, but on a small scale, they don't really respond to stimulus, like your cell trying to kill them. They don't really maintain homeostasis. They don't really um, adapt on the small scale, but over time, they can adapt to their environment. Like they can mutate, they can evolve. Again, that's on like population scales, not just like the individual uh, host that they're infecting. Uh, and so they can kind of reproduce sort of with help. Um, so they, they, they can't do that on their own. So we still don't consider them living. They do share a couple of characteristics though. So that's kind of the main takeaway. So, you know, they have genetic material and they change over time, but are they living? No, is still the consensus, but they certainly have been struggling with all living things since the beginning of life. Um, best guess is that they've been there, you know, maybe as long as 3.8 billion years when the first single-celled life was starting to develop on this planet. So um, that being said, what do they do with their time? Well, they're usually parasites. And so a parasite um, feeds off of a host, like we said, and usually it harms the organism in some way. So a classic example is like a flea is a parasite on a dog because it's harmful to that dog. Viruses are parasites on humans because they are harmful to them when they infect them. Um, and as they are parasites, they take over cellular machinery. They, they take over your cells and use them to reproduce themselves and make us feel sick kind of at the same time. Uh, viruses are called pathogens. And so um, a pathogen is anything that causes a disease that includes other things like bacteria, protists, um, fungi, but viruses are this one huge category that we're talking about now. Um, we'll get to the others much later. Uh, viruses have sort of two phases to their life. Um, they have a like an infectious phase and they have a sort of dormant phase. Um, depending on the virus you're talking about, the length of that phase might be different. So we're usually gonna fix, uh, focus on the active phase. Um, but 
some viruses are very dormant for very long periods of time, like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, um, is usually dormant and like inside of a human without doing much for years. Whereas like the flu is pretty active right away. Those are referred to as lytic and lysogenic infections, but we're, we're mainly gonna look at the lytic infection. Um, and so here's a bacteriophage, um, just a virus uh, attacking a bacteria. And here's what happens actually, we start here, like we've got a virus, it locks onto the bacteria, it injects its DNA, makes copies of itself, and then eventually like self-destructs the bacteria and causes it to uh, spread its copies throughout more bacteria. So again, there's sort of two phases here. We're usually gonna zone in on the lytic, and especially with coronavirus, we're focusing on the lytic, um, the rapid growth phase that makes people sick. Um, and so I will say that like with the coronavirus specifically, it seems that people have symptoms or are, let's put it this way, people are uh, capable of infecting others for a period of about two weeks. Uh, most, maybe even, well, at least half of people are asymptomatic, meaning they don't even feel sick, they don't even know it, but they could be infecting other people, which is part of the huge problem with coronavirus right now. We don't know who's had it and who doesn't have it. Um, and so that's one of the tests that the government is going to be developing is to figure out if you've had the virus. And we'll talk about how you might measure that um, in another video. But um, now what I want you to do for homework is I want you to look at the CDC website um, that I'll include a link for, which um, the Center for Disease Control um, put out this um, interactive simulation a couple years back, um, at least. And it's kind of interesting. They have you, you know, if you click on some of these things, they have you try to figure out what's going on with an infection and how to solve the case, so to speak. So it's kind of like you're you know, in the FBI or something. This one over here has to do with the Midwest. So, um, you know, you might click that and try and figure out what's going on. So you've got a mission, there's some conditions, except uh, you might have to do a little bit of reading. There's clues, tips, things you can click on. And then at the bottom here, you have to answer the question. It's sort of got A, B, or C, you gotta pick one. And if you did any reading and you're putting, putting things together up here on how the disease is spreading, you should be able to answer correctly. And then by the end, uh, hopefully you've figured out the cure. There's a whole bunch of these to try out. Um, some of them are maybe more difficult than others, but I encourage you to try them all uh, if you like, um, just to get some exposure to diseases and how they're spread. Because this is the kind of stuff that people are doing right now to try to cure, well, not just cure, but stop coronavirus. Um, and so, uh, yeah, check out this um, link, please, for homework, and we'll see you in the next video.